What are you hoping for? I have a lot of things I'm hoping for. I'm going to share them before we finish today. Several really beautiful things that I feel God has put on my heart to hope for what he wants to do and can do in us and through us. We're going to look at a passage in Romans chapter 15. It's a really interesting experience where Paul is talking to the people about challenges that they were having in their divisiveness. The gospel has come first to the Jews and now to the Gentiles. Jesus tore down all the walls of barriers between any kind of groups of people and made it possible that all could come to faith in him and have eternal life. But now some of the norms and the rules of people groups were being challenged. So in chapter 14, right before we get to 15, we're going to read in a moment, they were dealing with, should they eat food that had been sacrificed to idols? In the Jewish law, that was completely inappropriate. So now there are Jewish followers that have come to follow Jesus, and the door is open to the Gentiles, and some of these people don't have any problem with eating meat that's been offered to idols And they're greatly challenged, thinking this isn't right. And Paul gives them instruction on how to just defer to one another. That This rule was a man-made rule. Now at this point in time, Jesus came and he did away with the law. Some some of the law is done, done away with in that he fulfilled it. And this particular law for the Jews, they didn't need to absolutely follow. If they wanted to, fine. If If others didn't, that's fine too. And this is kind of the challenge that I feel like we face today. This seems like a really modern day example of how do we keep everyone going together. We have divisions that are immense these days. We've been through seasons of incredible divide, the political divide particularly. I made a comment in the book Incarnate that I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I am accountable. I'm not conservative, I'm not liberal, I am accountable. And really, if we can all find our pathway to Jesus in the path of life that we're trotting, we won't draw these lines of division. We, we like to have these party lines, and we get ourselves in all kinds of trouble about it. Now, we're walking through a worldwide pandemic, and there's more divisions. Some people believe in vaccinations, some people don't. Some people want to wear masks. Some people don't. What do we do? One of the things Paul didn't do is say, all right, all the people that want to eat meat, you form one church. All the people that don't, you form another church. No, he put them all together in one and said, work it out. Prefer one another. Don't make that the litmus test. And we tend to make issues of the day the litmus test for how we walk out our faith in this kind of a sad ordeal. Romans chapter 15, we're going to read the first 13 verses. I want to encourage you today, like we started last week with coming back to the basics, like Vince Lombardi said to his team one year, this is a football, and he held up a football in front of him. This is a Bible, and this Bible is our foundation, it's our fundamental. We're coming to the fundamentals today, and we're reading what God's Word says to us, Romans chapter 15. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. That, that's a verse right there that you could talk about for a while. That sometimes even who's strong and who's weak depends on your opinion as to which way to land. But no matter which side of that you fall on, we are not to please ourselves. That's really the point. You're going to find this throughout these verses about how God calls us to prefer others before ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. There's another one. I wish we could just really hunker down into these truths and get them into our hearts so we could live them out. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Why is it that we tear down so much? There's so much negative talk. There's so much criticism. There's so much division in the world today on just about any topic. And it's not biblical for us to take that posture. Sometimes we think we're doing it in a righteous way. 
Well, I'm doing it, you know, because this is the way of, of truth. Well, this is the way of truth. Right here, this is a Bible. This is God's truth. Let's walk in this way of truth. Let us, each of us, please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself. Here's the example we have. Who is this man? Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. The things that we deserve fell on Jesus. He didn't come to please himself. He came to help us. How beautiful is that? And that we have the chance to do the same for others. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. There's the word hope. We're going to come to it a couple more times. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. He's calling us to worship him with a common passion. We've been doing that today. It felt really good to come together in unity and worship God according to who he is and that's in our heart and we come into unity in that and we welcome one another in the process. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Jesus comes from the root of Jesse. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The God of hope wants us to abound in hope, that whatever is happening today that's not of our liking can change and we can find the pathway to victory in the hope that we have in Christ. One of the things that strikes me in the reading of this passage is that Jesus came to tear down the walls of division and he's bringing the gospel of his love to the Gentiles. And it's like looking at the world around us right now and those of us that are people of faith have common ground, but then those who are not faith followers we can easily target as an enemy, and that's not what Jesus came to do. He came to remove all the barriers. The people, no matter their background and where their origins are from, can all come to faith in God through him. This is our heart, and this is our passion, and should be how we treat the world around us. I am hoping that we place our love for Jesus ahead of all other concerns. We have... So many concerns of the day that we think are the biggest thing to focus on. Jesus is the biggest thing to focus on. If we could keep our thoughts on him and our attention toward him and let our message be about him, then we're going to make a difference in the world. If we get distracted by all the other things going on and make those things our message, we're not going to win the day in bringing the hope that we have in Christ to the world around us. Is God asking us to do anything more than what he has already done? He's not. Jesus came to give himself up for others. He calls us to take a similar path. Here's another example of it in Philippians chapter 2. We'll read just the first four verses that talk about how to have the attitude that Jesus has for the world around us. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, 
being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What a powerful statement of what our heart should be for others, that we count others more significant than ourselves. This is a conscious effort that doesn't come natural. We tend to think of ourselves ahead of others. We put together that way. It's our nature. But when we come into Jesus and come into following him for who he is, miracles can happen. We can change our view. We can change how we treat the people around us and even what we think of them. We think of others more significant than ourselves. In humility, we look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. It doesn't say we don't look out for our interests, but rather we look out not only for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. And we're preferring them ahead of ourselves. This is really what Jesus came to do. Three things I want to leave with you today as bullet points of hopefully memory on what this truth is speaking to us today about hope. I have hope today that we will flow together in unity in our capital family. Nothing can stop us when we walk in unity. This is so important and it's so hard because so many things get in the way of that unity. We're all in this together. We are more than followers of Christ. We're members of his body. Jesus is the head. We're part of the body. I personally am not his body. I'm one member of his body. So are you. We collectively make up the body with Jesus as the head. The body of Christ has been known to misbehave. Not all elements of his body are working together, making it happen. Sometimes the brain discounts the heart in this way. The brain is defining the intellect, the academic. When we're put together where we want to know a lot and we have a sharp intellect, it can, con it can conflict with the heart where somebody is kind of a feeling person. They have a lot of emotions. So the academic has a hard time with the worshiper. Sometimes there's some people that get into worship and the tears start flowing and their heart just softens and there's something that happens internally that's just automatic. And others like are in the same room not feeling anything and their mind is whirling. What does this mean? How do I really know him? And we have to get this intellectual process going. Well, we're all different. We need a brain and we need a heart. And it all flows together, and when we're uniquely different, but we all come together, how beautiful is that? I love it when there's emotion, even when I don't have it. It's not something that's flowing in my life at the moment, but someone else has it, and I can actually receive emotion through the emotion of another. I've had that experience when someone is talking, and they get touched with an emotion, and they begin to tear up. And it can touch me that way, like I start feeling it. I start feeling what they're feeling. We need each other. Someone else might have a brilliant thought, and I might not be processing something quite like that, and then that brilliant thought comes to me. We need each other, and we flow together in a beautiful way as the body. Sometimes in the body, the hands criticize the knees. The hands are people of action. People that want to do something, want to do something with my hands. Criticizing the knees as just a symbol of some people want to pray. We should all want to pray. But some people have a gift of prayer and intercession. Others have a gift of doing. I want to go get something done. I want to go take the groceries to the homeless. I want to go do something with my time and talent. And there's another that says, let me pray that God will open the door that's really powerful we need both. It's not one without the other. It's the body working together in a beautiful way. Sometimes the eyes refuse to partner with the feet. The eyes speak of a visionary. Some people can see things 
No one else can see. They dream up things. They have creativity. Creatives are really unique. And creatives have a great challenge figuring out how to walk together with a steady laborer, a person that's going to work with the feet to step, one step at a time, get that dream into reality. Dreamers can dream a dream, and then in a week, they've got a new dream. And the person walking it out is like, wait, we're not there yet. We need both. We need the dreamer and we need the plotter to make the thing happen. This is the body, how it all works together, and we've got all of this going on in our life at the same time. I have a hope today that we will influence the world to follow Jesus because they see the love we have for one another and for them. Will you pray with me for the day when the world is one, W-O-N, because the church is one, O-N-E. When we come together in unity and we love each other, we let that love spill over to loving the world around us. It's going to be infectious and cause people to want to follow him too. We have an opportunity to influence this world, and I have a hope about that today. I'm hoping for a unified church that is so in love with Jesus that it translates into love for others, regardless of one's position in life, regardless of their opinion of who they voted for, whether or not to wear a mask, where to eat, what songs we sing, what car we drive, etc. This is such a challenging time. How can we love on people who think different than we do? We have this constant epidemic, pandemic on, in our world, and it seems to keep shifting, and people are so divided in what to think about it. Vaccinations, not vaccinations. Masks, not masks. You know, I'm carrying a mask with me all the time. And I got used to not wearing it for a few weeks, being vaccinated. I thought that was a great blessing. And then now we're being asked to wear them again in some places indoors. And so I do. And I walk into places. And some places I walk into, nobody else is wearing one. And I think, man, what should I do? And sometimes I'm thinking about, I'm not trying to make a point. This is not a statement issue. This is I'm just trying to follow the plan and the pattern and I think of, is that, can I be sensitive to that other person? Sometimes I find myself taking my mask off because I just want to identify with the person who thinks that that's the way to roll. And then other times I am not thinking about it and I walk in and somebody's wearing a mask. I'm like, oh shoot, I need to get my mask on because I care about that person and I want to be sensitive to them and where they're at. And to me, that lines up with the scriptures to think of others more highly than ourselves. I have some opinions as to what to do, what not to do, but I'm also wanting to be extra sensitive to the people around me and what's happening in their thought life and in their journey, and I'm not trying to prove anything. And it gets really complicated because sometimes our convictions are really deep about what we should do one way or the other. But right now, sincerely, within the house of faith, we're, we're at odds with one another on these issues. I see it just constantly. People are saying all kinds of things toward one another that's very spiteful. And I read some of those things on social media and I'm thinking to myself, why did we ever decide to use social media in this manner where we just blast people who don't think the way we do or see the world the way we do? Everybody thinks that they're following an expert, no matter which side of the line they fall on. I think I know who the experts are that I'm going to. They matter to me. Like I think they've earned their status as experts, and I'm trying to listen to them. Someone else doesn't agree that the people I'm going to as experts are experts, and they have other people that they've listened to now that they claim are the experts, and we all do our research. And you know what our research is? Google. Like it's Amazing research we can do. We research until we find somebody saying what we want to hear. That's what our research amounts to, pretty much. This is the world we're living in right now. What do we do? I have a hope. I have a hope that we can get through this united, that we can get through this and stay focused on Jesus, that we can stop 
hating on others that don't think the way we do about any of the things going on in the world today. All of the conversations about everything that's wrong in the world, what does it do to just criticize and criticize and demean this person and that person? When the scriptures are talking to us about how to think of the other, bringing the gospel to the Gentile, bringing the gospel to the other, the person that the Jewish people thought, there's no way that they are going to, God didn't come for them, he just came for us. So we think sometimes these people that are out there that are so messed up in the way that they're living, we just need to get rid of them. No, that's not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is I came for them, I came for you, I came for them. And I have a hope that we can win the world because we're one in how we love on Jesus together. We need to rid ourselves of the negativity that is pervading our society today. It's pervading the church today. Dear God, help us that we don't line up with that kind of negative spirit, that we just criticize everything that comes along. God wants to do some new things in us. The gospel is good news. That is the definition of the gospel. It is good news. Why would we turn it into bad news? Why would we turn it into something spiteful when God gave it to us as good news that Jesus came to give us hope? to give us life and that life eternal. This is the final thought for the day. The highest, fullest, deepest, sweetest good of the gospel is God himself, enjoyed by his redeemed people. The gospel is the good news that Jesus bought the everlasting enjoyment of God for us to enjoy. Jesus purchased the ability for us to enjoy the goodness of God the Father. And he is good altogether. This is the highest, fullest, deepest, sweetest good of the gospel is God himself. We get a chance to connect to God who created heaven and earth, who created you and me, who holds everything together, who is going to work it all out for our good. He is such an amazing creator, lover of our soul, that Jesus, his son, would come and buy our redemption so we could have this communion with him forever. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I want to plant the seed of hope in your heart today. It's in mine. I'm hopeful for the beauty of God and his presence that we will abound in hope in him. Biblical hope is built on faith. Hope is the eager anticipation that comes with believing something good. God is going to do something good. He is. I know it. I have that hope in me. Titus 1-2 says, We have the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. That's a beautiful truth. Interesting that that even got stated in the line, that God, who does not lie, he's always a truth teller. People, you never know. You can't say that, but God, he does not lie. And he promised before the beginning of time the hope of eternal life for us. Now, here's some things I'm hoping for. Let me just rehearse some of my own hopes. I am hoping for the eradication of COVID. That's a hope strong in my heart. Like, get it on out of here. It's been such a huge disruption. I now have friends that are in heaven because of it. One of them last week, Larry Quackenbush, Randy's brother, lost his battle. And there are 600 and some thousand others Americans. And how many more around the world? I'm praying for the hope of the eradication of this pestilence on our land. I am hoping for a wet winter to overcome the drought we are experiencing. We need a deluge. It's a good thing for us to pray for. Like, come on, God, bring it on. We we need to fill up the reservoirs. 
I'm hoping for the fires to be extinguished that are raging in our state. It's horrific to watch these things. Man, I, I don't even know how to wrap my head around it, and it's not very far from us, and we breathe the smoke in the air, but it's nothing compared to the people that have been ravaged and lives lost, homes burned down. Unbelievable. I'm hoping for that to end. I'm hoping for a supernatural harvest of people coming to follow Jesus. That in these days, people will come to him. I have that hope. I don't ever want to lose that hope. Man, it's hard. We're trying to figure out how to come out of this season of disruption and all. But the gospel is the gospel. It's the good news. It always has been. It's the hope of eternal life. And it's such that people today have an opportunity to come. I'm not ever going to lose that hope that this world has more and more church houses full to capacity with souls that are coming to know the Savior. I have that hope for our city and for our world. I'm hoping for our school to reach capacity as we train children and youth to love love our world. We start school this week. We have room to continue to bring students in. We've had great progress from last year to this increase in enrollment. We want to fill up every seat. And not only that, but all the children that go to public schools, homeschool, all of our children grow in the knowledge of who Jesus is in their journey. I am hoping for our children's and youth ministries to flourish, for children and youth to get a passionate heart after God. I can see that in my mind, in my spirit. I am hoping for the Sacramento Kings to make the playoffs. (laughs) Why not? That one might not be so deeply spiritual, but it's real. It's real. It could be spiritual. I am hoping for partnerships in our community to help solve our homeless problem. We need help. We need to make progress. We're We're in the process, and may God help us. I'm hoping for the economy of our city to flourish, every business to flourish. I pray that over our city. I am hoping that our worship experience will bring us closer to Jesus every time we meet. I want that, his presence and his glory and the goodness, the taste of the goodness of God. I am hoping for my marriage to continue to grow as we celebrate our 42nd wedding anniversary this week. On Tuesday, August the 10th, that date stuck in my mind. I haven't been one of those people to forget it, thank God. And I don't want to get stale in our relationship at 42 years and counting. I'm hoping for creative inventions of new ways to reach our community on the heels of this COVID pandemic. New ways. We got shut down in doing the singing Christmas tree we'd done for 63 years. Not able to do it. Well, what's next? We can do something else. We'll figure it out. God will give us visions. He'll give us dreams. It's okay. We don't have to be stuck to, you know, I get concerned sometimes that we have, what do they call them? Um, What? Sacred cows. I was going to say holy cows. (laughs) I knew that wasn't right, but sacred cows that we get attached to some things that were beautiful and wonderful, but what's next? I have hope that God's going to show us new dreams and visions. I'm hoping for God's truth to prevail in our public square, to overcome false narratives, that truth, the truth of Jesus will flourish. I'm hoping that the God of hope will fill me with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I may abound in hope. And I'm praying that for you, too. Let me leave you with the lyrics of the first song we sang today. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between, 
all the things unseen in this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy come every battle because I know that's where you'll be. Every battle, he's going to be with us. I have that hope. I can see things. Hope is something that we can't tangibly see, but we can see it in the Spirit. And I'm hoping, and I have those hopes in my mind and in my heart that lead me, that motivate me, that cause me to get up in the morning, that cause me to love on people all the more, that cause me to follow this book. This passage today speaks to me about how I can put others first ahead of myself and see the goodness of God transform our world. Father God, we trust you today in the journey we're in for hope to flourish in every heart, no matter the battle. Thank you that you're with us in the fires and in the floods, and you're going to see us through. If you need Jesus in your heart today to forgive you, just receive him. Pray this prayer. Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept the gift that you offer of eternal life. Forgive me. Come into my heart, and I want to walk with you. I want to have a relationship with you forever. I accept that offer, that gift in Jesus' name. Amen.